What's up, Vankas? Before we get into this episode with the legend David Coulthard, we have a few announcements to make up top. We are doing a live show in New York City on December 8th at 7.30 at the City Winery Loft. Tickets will be in the description. Get your tickets. Final race of the year. Come celebrate with the Red Flags if you're in New York City. Also, our friends at Almost Friday have a new podcast with the one and only Johnny Manziel. It is called Glory Days, D-A-Z-E. So go check that out on everywhere that you get your podcasts, on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube. Go listen to Johnny Manziel relive the glory days of some of the greats of past and present. All right. With no further ado, let's go on to David Coulthard. What's up, Vanka? Hello, Vankas. How is everybody doing? How are you doing? Are you devastated that the season, the championship is over? It's done. It's finished. Lando Norris, he's out. He's done. <laughs> are you recovering? How are you doing? Well, I have some very good news for you. There is this guy we have on the podcast who I didn't know much about. I see him on TV. I hear him talking. I see him in, I see him in the show runs, and I read about him. And it, Brian, this guy, this guy David Coulthard, he's, it turns out he was actually pretty good at driving, he according to my am- research. He was amazing at driving. <laughs> and not only was he amazing at driving, he's also he's a competitor because he's a podcaster now, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're in the same media space. But I think that he, I, what I'm so looking forward to is the fact that I feel like he is the man who is most uniquely positioned to talk about like this season and the current state of Formula yes. One. Given his career, we are. He so was the thrilled. Forrest Gump, really, of for <laughs> of Formula One. He he touched <laughs> That's everything. Right. That's right. Uh, we're so thrilled to have David Coulthard on the podcast. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm just enjoying watching and listening to you guys. A bit disappointed that I actually have to speak. <laughs> well, well. Hey, we're not. I, as a narcissist, I am too. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> no, it's it's a pleasure to have you on. We've done so much research, and and I was reading your book, and I was like, there's so many parallels to what's going on right now, and there's so many points of reference to today, and and you and you had a hand in all of it. I mean, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, what are your? Is this is this the best season you've seen in a while? I mean, I mean, I know, I know, it's kind of. Doors feel shut, but I mean, how is this for you? You know, having seen so many seasons, both in and out of the co- cockpit, how has it been for you? Yeah, I think it, it definitely has to rate as one of the best Grand Prix seasons ever in terms of the amount of different driver combinations that have had victories. Uh, I think the most recent race uh, in Brazil was one of those moments where you know people reflect. Uh, f- those who've been watching the sport for a long time might reflect on. Donington 93, they talk about the lap of the gods with Ayrton Senna. You know, anyone that's that old, like myself, will be able to go, well, can you remember where you were when you saw Max Verstappen go from 17th to winning by 19 seconds and all the other good stuff that happened? So, and that's just one example of what's been, I think, a pretty uh, up and down emotional roller coaster of a Formula One season. But David, he was lucky. David, he got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't terrible. I would like some of that kind of luck. I would yeah. love that kind of luck. Well, you know, people were saying Lando said he was lucky. I mean, we t- we talked to Gunther the other day, and he was like, well, if it hadn't rained, you know, like, he wouldn't have had that opportunity. He made the most of the opportunity. But I guess as a racing driver, I wanted to ask you, like, people say, people who are not Grand Prix drivers say, you know, rain actually is is the great equalizer. And, and I mean, as, as someone who admires Max, you know, you'd like to, is that true? Is, 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 is rain really the, 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 when the rain comes down, does that really show who's, who's who out there? Is that how you feel? Yeah, I think I've never really understood the, 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 the sort of belief that it's an equalizer because if it was an equalizer, then they would all be as good as each other. It, to me, it's a differentiator. You know, Senna won his first ever Grand Prix, 85 Estoril. Could have won 84, Monaco, but they stopped the race a lap early. Schumacher, I think, won Barcelona with only four or five gears, you know, (laughs) stuck in fifth gear or something remarkable. I think what it does, it gives the exceptionals the chance, irrespective of the car, to show how exceptional they are. Does that make more sense? Yeah, no, that makes... 
Well, I think when they say equalizer, it means it like makes all the cars kind of equal. Like whatever car advantage you have kind of right disappears a little bit. Yeah, I think that's bullshit. I think that uh, <laughs> I think there is there is a scenario, and it was very well seen with the Alpine in Brazil. When you put wet tires or intermediate tires, the profile of the tire is different, of course. So therefore, the airflow that goes through the tire versus a slick, and the wake that comes off it is different. It diffuses the wake. I'm saying that as if I, you know, I'm an aerodynamicist and I really know what that means. But I, I, I remember in in some of the cars I drove that were, let's say, average cars in the dry, um, we were stronger in the wet relative to those that may have been stronger than us in the dry when you put the wet tires on. Because you're fundamentally changing not only the amount of surface grip there is, because you're putting wet, you know, uh, you're putting rain there, but you're you're changing the profile of the vehicle that's passing through the air that's available by putting wets or intermediate tires. So you're saying that a world beating car might be average in the wet and an average car might be better in the wet. Yeah, exactly what I should have summarized and just said it like you. Well, you know, that's why <laughs> <laughs> that's why you listen to our podcast and not David's. We, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we don't we we make it we try to make it as stupidly de 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 Yeah, you're too possible. smart is your problem. You're too, you're no, too smart. not at all. Absolutely. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I accepted the invitation to your podcast. How, how smart yeah, that's is that? Right. That's pretty dumb. That's pretty yeah. dumb. you know, it's sundowner time in Monte Carlo. I should be at the uh, Hotel de Paris drinking champagne. That's that's right. Wait, you know, we digress a little bit, but okay, you live in you live in Monaco, right? Yes, we we were we actually we had some of our interns who um, met you in Houston at the show run. And they asked you a couple of questions, but, you know, the word was on the street is that Charlotte Claire's mother cut your hair. Yeah, she did, um, okay. which if, if anyone doesn't like it now, then I have a different hairdresser. But yeah, for many years, <laughs> his, his, his mother uh, cut my hair. And uh, you know, where I, I'm sitting in my office now in, in Monaco, his mother's uh, salon is about 200 meters from here. Um, so she's cut Mark Weber and I'm sure many other of the drivers that popped in there. They, they're a very normal family within what could be seen as an no, abnormal principality. But the, the, the truth is of the 9,000 Monegasque the, you know, the actual citizens, they, they live just normal lives in this principality. It's the, the other 21,000 expats and foreigners like myself that come and make this right. place a bit crazy. Right. Is there a bit of a vibe like between like the, the locals and the people that come in? Is there like a, a divide? Is there, is there a vibe between those people? No, I don't think so. I think there's been an acceptance. You know, Monaco has long since um, grown and therefore survived in the modern world because of foreign investment, foreigners coming here to live, foreigners coming here to be tourists. Uh, but in amongst this this small 2.2 square kilometer principality, you'd be surprised how little you bump into other people. It, it, you know, I'm, I'm in a building next door to me is an ex-multiple Le Mans winner, Alan McNish. Next building over is Lando, I actually bumped into Lando in the parking earlier when I was coming into coming to the office, but that's quite rare. How's he um, looking? How's he how's he doing? Yeah, yeah, man. He, he he's handsome. He's a handsome boy. So, you know, I did tell him if all else fails, you've still got your looks. <laughs> <laughs> you said that to him? Yeah, of course I did. I'm oh, sure. I'm sure. I'm sure he felt great at the, Oh, at least I'm handsome. <laughs> great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, okay. Let's let's talked about Lando and I, I I do kind of want to talk about Lando with regards to your career because I think there's an interesting parallel here I mean you were at McLaren for many years you yeah, were there nine seasons were nine years you were there you know w w in championship seasons where it was you know you and Mika going at it and then also you were there with a pretty intense guy who was kind of running the table of formula one as well at the time which feels a parallel to max but so there's you know there's been a whole bunch of talk about you know uh team orders this year yeah. about who's the real number one driver at mclaren what is the culture of mclaren do they just not want to choose a number one driver versus a ferrari where it was like this is what it is you're, yeah. you're going to be there in support to michael i mean and, to, and, this, and and let these yeah. people know about Hareth in Australia. Let them know. Yeah. They, they, they think, <laughs> these, people, these people think they, they know pain. Yeah, let them absolutely. know, David. Okay. These well, pre-DTS people, they don't know. 
Yeah, yeah, indeed. So I, I, as a driver, moved over a couple of times under team orders when they weren't actually allowed in the sport. But of course, just because they're not allowed doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. And, and actually, I think that when we opened up and said you could do it, I think that's just being fair to our audience. You know, I'm a fan of the sport. I happen to be a driver for a period of time, but it doesn't change the fact we grew up following it. And so I think it's right that it, it, it's allowed to give team orders because in the end, the drivers are paid by the team. If they don't like it, they can go somewhere else. Um, even if it was uncomfortable for me to give away victories because you, you work hard to, to get those victories. Coming on to where McLaren are this year, I've already said, and, and of course, um, w people within the team who I know well, and you know, I, I know the DNA of that team from, from my time there, they may see it differently. And of course, they've got more information at their disposal. But I feel that their performance this year came as a surprise. I think they came into the year, Max was winning a bunch of races, and they're going, this is, we're still rebuilding, we're more competitive, you know, 20. 526 is where we're really going to be challenging for world titles. So I think they were a little bit surprised just how good they were come mid-season. And with that surprise came, uh, oh my God, uh, how do we do this? They, they weren't as match fit as Red Bull when it came to making, you know, let's say bold decisions. I think they've got on top of it, but I think that Budapest was just awkward. It was awkward for the drivers. It was awkward for us in commentary. It was awkward for Oscar. But I think they've they've kind of got through that now. And everyone understands Oscar is there to support Lando. I'm sure he doesn't love it, but he's paid there to, to drive their car. And what goes around hopefully will come around. As it happens, I never got the victories back from Mika. He moved over to give me a third place once. But <laughs> right. um, he David, probably feels... David. But that, but David, I don't believe you, David, because you said in your book that you regret moving over for Mika. You regret. Well, look, of course, of course, I do, because in pure sporting terms, mm. you, you it, it's not show friends. It's you know show business. It's just quote Jerry Maguire. You you want to get out and let the racing gods decide. When you are being manipulated, it ain't a great feeling. I did it because I respected the contract I had, but if. If I was more like a Michael or more like an Ayrton or more like a Lewis or more like a Max, I probably would have said, you know, yeah. F you right. and deal with it afterwards. But I'm not. I'm a village boy. I believe in the sporting conduct. If we've made an agreement, you stick to the agreement. Um, and and that's that's a comfort that I will take with me to my last breath. Okay, I want to talk about that mentality I mean, there's. I think we've discussed a lot this year, like the mentality of Lando versus Max, like just taking those two guys because yeah. they feel like they're at opposite ends of the thing. You know, even yeah. even this week, um, yeah, this this episode will come out a little bit uh, in, in a couple weeks, but this is right after Brazil. Like this whole uh, the, the week leading up to it, Lando was like, you know, I don't have to change. Like I'm doing it the right way. He's got to change how he drives. And then after the race in Brazil, he said, well, I'm a three time champion, so I don't have to change shit basically um and you know i kind of have this desire as a lando fan because i kind of chose lando when i first became a fan i was like he's my guy i want him to take like a villain turn like i wanted him to go against team orders and just win that race in hungary and just be like i don't care like i'm a i'm a killer like max like schumacher like senna but he's a nice guy he's a nice guy daniel ricardo's a nice guy like, uh, are we I, over? Are we overstating the psychology here, or do you think there's something? I mean, you said it yourself. You, you, yeah. you, you suffered, not suffered. I mean, you're saying, you know what? I, uh, I was a nice guy. I, I, I had to, I had to eat a little crow back then, but I can, I could sleep happy now with the way I conducted myself. Yeah, um, I, I'm right. absolutely saying that. Look, it, it's like remember when Floyd Mayweather accepted the invitation from Conor McGregor to fight each other. There's a reason why he fought him in boxing and not you know, UFC or, you know, MMA, because it, it, he's got control of that territory. So Max is Conor McGregor. He's UFC. Yeah. Right. And Lando at the moment is is a, a incredibly talented boxer. Mm. But who's going to who's going to win if there was no no rules in that? Right. And it's going to be the guy that's going to, you know, with with the exception of eye gouging and testicle tickling, everything else goes. And <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and Max has been doing that for for a long time. So Lando will get there, um, and he'll get there, and he'll he'll win he'll win more races, he'll win championships on his talent. But Max is 
he is that's why he deserves to be in the same category as a as an Ayrton, a Michael. I say Lewis, but I put in brackets Lewis because Lewis actually has done it in a very, let's say, uncontroversial way. Um yeah. I know there was the contacts with Max in in his the Chapman Max's first championship year at Silverstone. That that's about as much sort of you know on the edge contact I've seen from Lewis. He's a very right. clean racer. He, he he manages to keep out of a lot of controversy through his career. So he's the sort of anomaly in in that group of the the, the villains that you Wait, you see. I want to I want right. to I want to I want to drill down onto that because people say oh Lewis did it clean, but Lewis, with the exception of 08, I think, and the and. 2021 he had such a car advantage when max had a car advantage people were like wait has max learned his lesson remember that was a discourse <laughs> yeah. last year when max was winning by 900 seconds they're like no no he's changed i was and i was thinking to myself he hasn't changed he doesn't need to dive bomb he doesn't need to be a a terrorist out there when he has a serious car advantage how much of how much of lewis's cleanness was because mercedes was very dominant and Bottas wasn't giving him too much of a headache. Uh, look, you're absolutely spot on. I think that there was a very there was a comfortable period there for Lewis where they had car advantage, and he's an exceptional driver. It doesn't diminish the results he's had, but right. of course, when he has gone wheel to wheel with Max, normally Max has come out in front because you know he's he's got that that absolute fighting spirit. So you know we will be debating this. Yeah. beyond our lifetimes about you know the rights and wrongs and it's just, it transcends into other sports you know soccer players or, or or tennis players whatever there's always going to be the ones that are seen as being a little bit on edge when it comes yeah. to where is the line but what they've actually done is redefined the modern era of where the line is you know michael did it ayrton did it <laughs> max is is doing it and that's because every generation should be better now better doesn't mean nicer better just right. means you know they deliver they deliver the victories when other drivers might not vankas the holidays are coming up you know what that means you're going to be surrounded by family and they can stress you out if you come from a jewish family like me and matt guess what the cortisol you're going to develop cortisol face because your family's so freaking stressful how do you how do you how do you wind down at thanksgiving how do you wind down at christmas hanukkah new year's you turn to our friends over at cbdmd more specifically the delta 9 thc drink mixer with cbdmd you could be chiller than that meme of fernando alonso sitting in the in the lawn chair at uh at spa you could be Fernando Alonso sniffing the flowers. You could just be blissed out like Fernando Alonso in the year where he was actually getting podiums, podiums with Aston Martin. If not, you're going to be you're going to be stressed out. You're going to be stressed out like Lewis Hamilton with the porpoising car. You're going to be stressed out like Max Verstappen when he says that he can't curse. No, 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 no. You don't want that. You want to be on your blissful Fernando Alonso wave and that's what you get with CBD md and because we're great guys you can go to cbd.com and use the code red flags for 30 percent off that cbdmd.com use the promo code red flags at checkout for 30 percent off now back to the show what does it do like to the paddock when you have a guy like that i mean you know in, in the schumacher days when like you know he was kind of like this is my it, this is this is F one is mine. Like I'm, he's the, he's I'm the school king, bully. I'm the school bully. I'm <laughs> yeah. King Kong. Yeah. You know, you had a couple run-ins with him, which were, <laughs> if 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 not fifty fifty, more his fault. And he was like, you you said it before. He was like, nope, don't see it that way. Not my yeah. fault, actually. Fuck you, David. <laughs> like yeah. that was kind of he his asked you attitude. if you were ever wrong. And you, you, said, <laughs> you turn it. You, you, you did that. You did what I did to my what I did to my parents. I like you. Is it? Can you just okay? Maybe I'm wrong this time, but can you at least admit you were wrong like once in your life? And he was like, ah, I don't recall a time where I was ever wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amazing self belief. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what does that kind of do? Like, you know, d does everyone on the paddock feel that? Like going into, I mean, you had some great on track battles with Michael. Like, you know, does it make you think twice? Did you have to kind of like psych yourself up for like a battle with Michael because you knew that he was? That's what it seems like with Max is that like he's he's he said like oh if you throw it inside like I'll push us both off track I don't care which is not how other drivers like what what did it do to you uh, in in terms of your mental game? 
Yeah, of course, you, you approach different drivers in different ways. You know, Michael uh, may as well have had approach with caution written on the rear wing because <laughs> unless you unless you absolutely got it alongside him, you 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 would expect him to close down the, the gap. And that was in his racing DNA. And actually, I don't I don't have a problem with the consistent behavior of somebody. It's when you've got these in inconsistent people, you know, the ones that say hello one day, the next day ignore you. You know, I struggle with that. It's like, you know, what is going on with them? Michael was consistent. He was consistently hard on the racetrack. And that actually is something that then becomes kind of fun to deal with because you know you've got to be on your A game if you're going to beat him. And, you know, I, I'm not in the same class as him or any of the other multiple world champions. I know that. So I don't need anyone to sort of, you know, reach out and go, by the way, you were, you know, you only won a few Grand Prix, which is why when I did have the Grand Prix where Michael was beside me in second or my teammate and and vice versa, you know, if you had your teammate and Michael on the podium, you knew you'd done a, a, an exceptional job. And what is the difference between someone like myself and your Michaels, your Maxes, your Lewises? These guys don't really have bad days. You know, of course, they'll have the odd mistake and they're not, you know, none of them are superhuman, but they're so consistently brilliant at what they do. That's why they're high achievers. Um, I want to I want to drill down into your teammate and, and the sort of dynamics and uh, what we what sort of insight we could bring to today, because you talked about g g going to McLaren and immediately you, you said you sensed, ooh, I'm the redhead stepchild here. Like. Ron's got a blonde you, you, baby. You don't boy. call it you don't call it ginger over there. We do call it ginger, but the the phrase "redheaded ah, stepchild" okay. is that's the yeah we call it ginger here too. And but, as okay. a guy and as and as a guy from Scotland, you might have that might have been you know intense because oh yeah, <laughs> a fair amount yeah. of red yeah yeah. <laughs> so when you realized you were the red you were the ginger stepchild, I'll I'll translate it for you. Um, <laughs> did, how, like you you talked about how it was that. People argue about the merit of team orders. First, I want to ask you why, because it seemed like immediate. It would seem like before either of you had really begun there, Ron had picked. So it wasn't, it, it seemed like it was almost personal. It was like, wait a minute. Yeah. Second, do, do you believe in team orders? Do you believe in picking a driver or do or you like let them race? If you were running, if it was, you know, if Coltard, if it was DCF1 or whatever yeah. the team was called, or would you just let them race? Because it seemed like it had a real diminishing effect on you psychologically. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that Ron, it took him many years. And as I say, I was there nine seasons. So that's a long time to be with one team. And it took years, I don't know, maybe five, six years for him to eventually open up and say to me, look, I do feel a, a, a closeness to Mika because I was standing over his hospital bed in Adelaide 95. He's wired up in an induced coma and he's just had a crash in one of my cars. I don't know if I'm standing over his future deathbed or whether he'll ever race again. I get that. I didn't get it at the time because for me, Mika had the crash. I was racing for Williams. Mm. We we heard he was on, you know, he was poorly, but we heard he was recovering. And then I knew I was going to be uh, at the team, but I didn't know if he'd be my teammate still. He recovered, he came back, and therefore the rest is history. He went on to win two world championships. But selfishly, I wasn't fearing for Mika. I was thinking about my future. You know, it, 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 sport is not the place to go if you feel uncomfortable around selfish people. We are selfish. The other person's failing is our opportunity. So you never would wish ill, physical harm on anybody, but you're, I'm not going to cry if my teammate engine blows up. You know, I, I felt good about it if my teammate's engine blew up, especially if he's in front of me. <laughs> yeah. When mine then subsequently blew up, I didn't feel quite so good about it. But um, so, you know, it's the, the weird misnomer teammate. He's not your mate. He's your biggest rival. And that's why in many cases you have a team where there's a clear number one and a clear number two. When you do have that number one equal, it usually comes to a head and it usually ends up not working out. But to answer your question, I would want the two best drivers I can put in the car and I would want nature to take its course because mm. that is what I love to watch. I love watching that as a kid. I love watching it now in retirement. And yeah, I, I don't want to... It's embarrassing when the number two is so number two that, you know, he's, he's basically like he's doing a number two while he's driving. It's so poor. <laughs> 
David, would you love it as much if you were writing the checks, though? Uh, yeah, because success is success. So if you're writing the checks for the two best drivers in the world, the sponsors are going to be with you. The prize money is going to be with you. You know, you, you're going to, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be just fine Unless until it's they 07. fall out. Unless it's 07. Well, um, that was what, uh, are you talking about? Alonso uh, and Hamilton. Alonso and Hamilton. Yeah. 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 Well, they, they fell out pretty early because Alonso thought he'd signed a number one contract. And then when he went, apparently he said when Ron had told him that it would be Lewis in the other car, he'd said to him, what, you don't want to win the constructors? He completely <laughs> underestimated <laughs> Lewis's potential. Right. And anyone who's seen Lewis from karting all the way through the lower formula knew he was special. You can never tell how, how they deliver in Formula One because that is the biggest challenge. Some guys who are average in F2 or Formula 3000, it was in my day, do an exceptional job in Formula One and vice versa. So Formula One is the only place you can really judge talent. Everyone who gets super excited about karting world champions and Formula 3 champions, there's a number of drivers in F1 who won F3, F2, and they're pretty average in Formula One. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why 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 is why are the feeder series so terrible at figuring out who's actually the best? Because Formula One is just such a different. It's not just about driving race cars. It's the whole media scrum. It's the partners, the sponsors, the fans. It's so far and away different the job of being a Grand Prix driver than when you're in the lower formula. It's your parents and you know a. a, a benefactor who's turning up to watch you. There's no real media value in the lower formulas that would be significant for any any sponsor to be involved. It's Formula One or nothing when it comes to the global partners and the spotlight of interest. You know, you, you're not doing your podcast talking about the guy who's just won GB4 or Formula 3 because <laughs> there's no guarantee they're ever going to make Formula 2, never mind Formula 1. Right. right. When you were growing up, when you were a kid, was F1, I mean, like, who, A, you know, did you have heroes when you were a kid? Like, who did you grow up watching? Who were you most inspired by as you on your way up? And was, was Formula One, like, truly just always the goal? Because, I, you know, you talk to some of these guys and they're like, you know, it was so in the distance. Who knew? I just wanted to, like, have a career as a racing driver. Like, did, did you exceed your wildest expectations? Yeah. Where did Formula One live for you as, as a young Hundred percent, hundred percent exceeded expectations. My father told me when I was fourteen, we were sitting in the optimistically named Sun Lounge in our house in Scotland because the sun didn't come out very yeah. often. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. we we had a Sun Lounge, so we're in the a Sun prayer. Lounge. Yeah, fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah, <laughs> and we're we're watching what was highlights of the Formula One race. It was a thirty-minute broadcast. And that was everything. We got the start of the race, the bit in the middle, and the checker flag and the <laughs> podium. 30 minutes. And yeah. we got that 15 times a year. So it's not, there wasn't podcasts, there wasn't internet, there wasn't, you know, all of this back information. So Formula One, I loved watching it with my dad. When I was 14, he said, when you get to Formula One, I think you should move to Monaco. And when you finish your career, I think you should work in television. 10 years later, I moved to Monaco and then 15 follow, uh, further years, I, I started working with BBC. So he had a great vision and belief in my ability. I thought I was, I was in a hobby. I thought this was just a brilliant hobby. I was winning in karting. I moved to cars and I was winning and I became a test driver of Williams. And then sadly, Ayrton passed away. And then suddenly I'm a Grand Prix driver. The whole thing was just like a, a magic carpet ride for someone who grew up in a village of 300 people. And my nearest town was like 30 miles away. You know, my nearest cinema was 30 miles away. Uh, fast food joint, 30 miles away. You know, I, I grew up in the countryside. I was more likely to be a farmer than a Grand Prix driver. Bankers, as you know, we have teamed up with BetMGM this season and we are using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks. And if you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use bonus code DADDY and you will get up to $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here is how it works. You download the BetMGM app and you sign up using the bonus code Daddy, because we're fun, deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You'll receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your bet loses. Just make sure that you use the bonus code DADDY when you sign up. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use bonus code DADDY and get your first $1,500 first bet offer today. 
See BetMGM.com for terms. 21 and over. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Available in the U.S. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY for New York. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP for Arizona. 1-800-327-5050 for Massachusetts. 1-800-BETS-OFF for Indiana. 1-800-981-0023 for Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only. Subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use bonus code DADDY and get your $1,500 first bet offer today. Thank us not only does Cash App sponsor our favorite perfectly branded Formula One team, but they also make it easier for you to save money so you can do the things you love, like going to an F1 race. Listen, to be honest, we thought that Cash App was just a way to send people money. Hey, Cash App me for that, but it's a way faster and simpler way to bank. You can start saving with as little as $1, no hidden fees, no minimum balance requirements, no account fees. And we all know that overdraft fees make no sense. Why are you charging someone if they don't have any money? Plus, when you deposit $300 or more in paychecks, you can get up to $50 in free overdraft coverage. It pays to get paid on Cash App, so go download the app today. What are you doing? Now back to the show. So uh, where, yeah, how did that happen then? I mean, was it, it was, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, the fathers of Grand Prix drivers. You know, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of similar, often they're very tough. They're very hard on their kids. They push them sometimes to the point where people, you know, ask questions. It's like, but, but some, you know, there's, it, it's consistent. There's lots of, there's lots of examples of it. Where, where was your dad on that, that spectrum? I was reflecting on this actually, because my son is just turning 16 and he'll go to GB4, which is like a British version of F4 next year. Mm. And it, it is quite difficult for him to sort of take any advice from me. I I sense that. So I tend to step back. And the great thing with my father, he knew nothing about car racing because he'd never done it. So he never, ever tried to give me advice on driving. But what he did do when I was in karting, if he didn't think I was performing, he would go, wasting our time. Right, cart, back of the van, we're going home. So he, he was tough in that respect. And I'd be like, no, no, dad, I, 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 let, me get, let me have another go. I'm sure I can do better. You know? So it was tough in that he, he, he knew my potential was greater than what I was delivering on certain occasions. And then poor guy and my mom had to observe that when they had no control over me in Formula One. You know, mm. if I'm crashing the car in the pit wall, <laughs> they're going, his potential is so much better than that. But he, <laughs> he's brought shame to the family name by, you know, doing that dumbass thing. But he, he's, um, the, he's the marshal. He's dragging your car. He's like, nope. Yeah. Sorry, David, taking this car away from you. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. But yeah, I, I think tough love. Uh, and I'm failing uh, as a father in that respect because, <laughs> you know, in modern time, you kind of advise your kids. You don't really give them the the same um what's the word uh you know we we don't we don't give them the same ultimatums i think that my generation were given we also yeah. my generation the, the teacher could belt you at school any of that happened nowadays oh my god there, there would be you know outcry did you or do you regret is, is it, it sucks because like you, you you know so you have so much to give your son in terms of knowledge, but like you're his dad, so it's lame and he doesn't want to listen yeah, to yeah. his dad. <laughs> right. Like do you do you sometimes wish like you're like, damn, I wish I could be his uncle, you know, just so I could because right. then he might well, listen to you, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I guess we're all different. And I'm realizing it is difficult for the kids to to take advice from their parents. Um, you know, in my office here there's a simulator. Uh, he could probably school me on the simulator because I'm, you know, old generation, but that's it. Car wise, there's a lot I can observe and I can advise and help. But I guess in some respects, you've got to admire that people want to kind of give it a crack on, the, on their own. That said, I am funding the whole thing. So I'm not only his dad, I'm his major sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You're like, I'm not speaking to you as, I'm not speaking to you as a father right now. I'm speaking to you as an investor. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a board meeting and we're not happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, we have a board meeting by the, by the dinner table over here. And yeah. uh, <laughs> investor's so not later. happy. So break later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Invest <laughs> investor wants you to break later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess I want to move over to Red Bull for a second. Mm -hmm. Um, Red Bull, what Re, Red Bull's in an interesting place. They were, they were top of the world, ma. Then it was, oh my God, they're falling apart. Now it seems like they're hanging on and they're going to, they're, I mean, the, the constructors is, is gone for sure. But, um, obviously 
people don't know this largely, but you were at Red Bull. I mean, people who know know, but you know, new newer fans don't. You were not only at Red Bull, but you brought Adrian Newey to Red Bull from McLaren. <laughs> you are you are one hundred percent responsible for for him being there. And I won't I won't hear it any other way. That's what I took from your book. And now he's leaving. So I guess how did you fuck that? How did you personally fuck that up? What's going on over there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, in fairness, uh, very briefly, it was actually Christian. When I joined Red Bull, having worked with Adrian at Williams, winning car, McLaren, winning car, yeah. I was so in the sort of weeds of trying to understand how do we take this formerly owned by Ford Jaguar branded team and and bring them to a level where we can actually, you know, develop and be a winning team in the future. I, the, I, I didn't even have Adrian in my mind at that time. So Christian came with that and said, look, what about Adrian? And then I was like, well, look, you know, this is how I think we would start a conversation with Adrian. So I became involved at that stage, brought the meetings together, and then a deal was done. So that's bringing it all into a, a short form. The fact that Adrian stayed, what, 16, 17 years is is fantastic. And I think that this will be undoubtedly the longest period of his career with any one team. The fact that it came undone the way it did, I, you know, I'm not enjoying that. I don't feel good about it. I think that a lot of people, when they reflect on decisions made somewhere down the line, they, they may feel that they haven't acted in, in, in totally the best, the most human way, because it's very easy for people to go, well, I don't like it. I can, I've got a clause in my contract bugger you, I'm out. You know, we can, we can all, you know, marriage contracts. I don't like this anymore. Fuck you. Yeah. You know, get, send your lawyer. You know, every contract can be broken. Um, but if there's a, if there's a open dialogue and willingness and all the rest of it, then, you know, you tend to find a way of working these things out. So, um, I, I take the view, having given you that teaser, um, that I'm not going to elaborate on that we should <laughs> celebrate, we should celebrate the time Adrian was with the team. And now he's decided to, you know, make a bed in a, in a new venture, and you know he's been given, uh, he's been given shares in Aston and all those good things. And you know, I genuinely, as he's a friend, I wish him all the best with that journey. Um, and Red Bull are, will get on with the other thousand people that work for the organisation because it doesn't all hinge on on one individual. Although you would have to say. You could argue it did during the Bel uh, the Brazilian Grand Prix because I don't know if as many drivers could have done what Max did, mm. but that's why your your chief designer uh, or your technical officer and your number one driver are two of the most important investments you'll ever make, and that's what I said to Mister Matashutz when he was alive. You know, at the point where it became clear that Adrian was interested, Mister Matashutz was not very happy to pay the amount that was being asked. And I remember saying, you would pay that for a driver and more if he was considered number one driver in the world. I would pay it for what I consider to be the number one designer in the world. He reflected on it. He agreed to it. Adrian joined. The rest is history. How important is that kind of, um, you know, when Dietrich died, you know, there was this seemed like there was this power vacuum. Then all of a sudden there was more kind of a bunch of cooks in the kitchen as opposed to the one. Yeah. It seems like Adrian moving to Aston is maybe because he enjoyed that kind of, you know, I don't want to deal with bureaucracy. I don't want to deal with red tape. I just want to be able to like make the thing that I want to make. I think we've seen that struggle maybe over at Ferrari. We've seen that struggle, you know, in, in some of these bigger teams, it's harder to steer that ship. Um, how important do you feel like those quick decisions are towards making uh, like a great racing team? Yeah, I think Adrian um, certainly doesn't like all that. You know, Adrian yeah. likes to do what he likes to do, which is read the technical regulations, find out what they don't say, and then try and design a car within right. that window. Um, I think Bernie Ecclestone, who was the uh, promoter of Formula One for many years before Liberty bought it, said dictatorships without weapons work. And by that, he meant... Mm. <laughs> By that he meant things tend to get done when there's one leader, when it's quite clear who that leader is. And mm -hmm. and and Mr. Marischitz was that man. He, he when when he made a decision on something, everybody yeah. went, Yeah, okay, that decision has been made. Him passing, sadly, after what was an incredible life, created a vacuum and and you know, as everybody kind of was trying to figure out what 
Red Bull is as a as an energy drinks company post him and mm. what their assets that they own to promote the brand, football teams and ice hockey teams and a couple of Formula One teams and a racetrack, you know, just all the typical things that yeah. large companies have in their armory <laughs> when it comes to marketing their products. Right. You know, what a visionary man that he yeah. didn't want to be sponsor of teams. He wanted ownership of the team because then he wasn't being dictated to by anyone. That said, he didn't try and tell Adrian how to design the car or tell me how to drive the car or tell me not to crash the car. He empowers and then lets people get on with it. And if they're not good enough, he changes and then brings in the next group. So I, I think in that respect, um, the, the company has gone through re reestablishing the new ground rules uh, of how that works from Austria to the various assets that they own. But if they win this world championship with Max, I think it will vindicate the 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 quality of what's been there before. If they don't win it, there's so many haters out there that they'll go, yeah, take that Red Bull, take that Max. You've got your, you know, your your just you know, you're just rewards for not being our favorite team and driver. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I admire success, whether whether it's the recent success McLaren's had or whether it was Ferrari at the time with Michael, of course I wanted to beat them. But you, you've got to be a psychopath not to acknowledge when someone's doing a better job. Yeah, And you've got to use that as the motivational factor to, to know what is possible and what you can drag out of yourself and what you need to drag out of your team to, to achieve what they're doing. They are the benchmark. And whoever the new benchmark is, we should admire them and not, not be not be aggressively critical of success. Is it weird um, that, you know, when you joined Red Bull, they were the fun sort of upstart team that nobody took seriously. And they were kind of, everyone's like, what is this weird energy drinks company that <laughs> it's it, it, that plays the loud music and sponsors the guys jumping out of airplanes and, what the hell is that? And it had this fun. I mean, Adrian talks about it in his book. There was they were sort of punk rock. Is it weird now that they're now all of a sudden the Death Star? Is that a weird? Is that a weird thing for you? It's like when did when did I become a? I didn't feel like I was joining the the the, the dark side when I joined, but now all of a sudden I'm I'm in a stormtrooper. Yeah, when, it's like, like, how, yeah, like it's like now snowboarding is lame. Yeah, it's, like millennials all were like, "I'm punk rock, I snowboard." Now they have kids, and their kids are like, "Oh, dad, like you're so lame." Like so, kids ski now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Look, nothing lasts forever. There's always an evolution. Next generation should have a different point of view. Yeah, I think that I have been. My parents were born just at the end of the World Wars grew up out of out of that you know i was given the next group of opportunity you guys are much younger so you're living a completely different child well, you're adults but i mean you lived a different childhood of opportunity and uh, you know I, I i was a generation where you'd never questioned authority you know otherwise you were in a lot of trouble <laughs> today of course we should question authority if we think they're saying something that's not correct so i think that there's definitely this this sort of evolution of how the team has started and where it's been for the majority of its winning and there'll be another upstart at some point when there's a leader a dictator without arms who's got the bravery and the commitment to to change the way the the, the sporting entities operate mr marish has had that across all a number of different sports entities and i think he was a remarkable man and a lot of the other teams they are they, they they're not shareholders in the in in the teams. Of course, they're they work for major shareholders. They're hired hands. They don't have they've they've got the skills, but the buck doesn't ultimately stop with them because if the board don't like their performance, they can be replaced. It's quite difficult to fire yourself if you're the owner of the company. Well, it's it, you know there's this famous clip. There's a panel. It's I think it's Brundle. I think it's your podcast co-host Eddie. Yeah. And yourself and someone else and, and everyone saying, like, who's going to win the championship ne next year? Everyone says Lewis Hamilton with McLaren, your former team, McLaren. So you had you had allegiances to both. And you say Sebastian Vettel uh, and with Red Bull and every, they they laugh in your face, David. They all laugh in your face. And it was like the ultimate, like, how you like me now? <laughs> I mean, were you did, did you kind of like 
were you like the guy wearing parachute pants before they were cool in the paddock? Like, and now, and, and then everyone realizes that they're actually cool. Like, how often, you know, were you on a limb with your support of them in the in the early days? No, I I believe that because Adrian had been there, I'd seen the evolution of the team. Uh, Sebastian and Mark Weber were were teammates at that time, both very fast drivers. I just felt that that it was they were the coming team. And uh, I, I don't make bold predictions very often. Um, but on that case, uh, I was obviously against what everyone else thought. And hey, what can I say? I was right. Again. You're, you're, you, you were such a believer in Vettel that you gave him your car when you hurt your neck during a test. Yeah, I did. And my, my manager at the time was Martin Brundle, who you've mentioned, who works yes. uh, as a, right. you know, a legendary broadcaster with Sky. And um, I used to be managed by IMG, which you may have heard of, Mark yes. McCormack, big yeah. management company. But I, I wanted to leave that to be with a, a, a smaller group of management that understood what I was doing as a race driver. And it coincided with Martin retiring or being retired. And it was perfect because when, when I spoke to my manager, he not only knew all the teams and the team principals, he also knew what it was like to drive a Grand Prix car. So anyway, a, a good decision. And Martin and I, I think, worked together for 10 years. But um, yeah, when I told him at the time, uh, I phoned him up and said, look, I'm, I, I tweaked a neck. I'm, I can't drive today, but I put Sebastian in the car. I spoke to Christian said, look, there's no point in the car sitting there. He was testing with Alpha Tauri, eh, sorry, Toro Rosso, as it was at that time. Yeah. And uh, Martin said, it's like a turkey voting for Thanksgiving or, <laughs> or for, for Christmas. And I thought that was quite a funny way of looking at it. But I just felt it was part of my role as a, coming towards the end of my career to help the team get confirmation of where their future lay. And I think that's why I've maintained a good relationship with Red Bull, you know, what was it, 16 years after I stopped racing for them because mm. I, I wasn't forced out the door. I went willingly. I did my time. I loved my time in Formula One. And what's it like? Because we've seen some of his... Sa I mean, Martin Brunel has become famous <laughs> not, not really for his broadcasting, but for just being sassy on the grid. Yeah. What's it like having that guy on the other end of the phone like giving you career... Is he as sassy like behind the scenes as he is in public what's what's that like M martin is a diligent hard-working individual and I'm, I'm actually amazed that no one else had reached out to him to be a manager or maybe they have and he's chosen not to do it uh he he's he is a grafter as, as we'd say over here he works hard he 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 doesn't wing it you know he he knows his stuff so when when he's being sassy a lot of that, I don't doubt, is he's kind of weighed up the pros and cons of what might face him on the grid. And therefore, he's not going in without a little bit of protection. I'm not going to say he's taken the wrapper off the condom. I'm not going to say he's wearing it, but he's got a little bit of protection. Uh, <laughs> he's prepared. Uh Awkward silence. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to process. Have I gone across a boundary? Trying, no, no, no. You know, I'm just, just processing what you said. Just like a Rorschach test. Like, what does this make you think of? And now I'm thinking of Martin Brundle and condoms. And now I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't think that's what I'd be thinking about this afternoon. Um, oh, my God. So <laughs> that, that totally threw me off. But uh, is, I this a, first, is this a first? Is this a first? guys so. are being somewhat. This is the first time we've been speechless on a pod. Well, that's... Oh my god! Because hey, I don't I feel this is a badge of honor. Yeah. I don't expect because I don't expect something crass from you. You're so eloquent. That's right. And then it just it just came out of left field. It was uh, it was it was delightful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> quite i just didn't understand what yeah, you were I was saying i think i'm trying to digest the, the metaphor you know look i'm, I'm saying he's, he's not prepared. he's the condoms half on i didn't quite get what you were saying <laughs> but what i'm saying is he doesn't go he doesn't go unprepared so i, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes out when, when, when he was a younger man and he was single if he went out clubbing i'm going to say he had one already on just in case <laughs> just in <I> case <laughs> he's prepared he's really does you he I does see. his diligence. And, he was yeah. out of here. So, so, yeah, so it's premeditated. All his murders on the grid are premeditated. Not entirely an accident. 
<laughs> right, exactly. Okay, okay. Vankas, this episode is brought to you by Ricky Canned Cocktails. It's a premium spirit-based drink, 7% alcohol in a can, one and a half shots per can. It's the perfect drink, and that's why I've been drinking a bunch of the Ricky Canned Cocktails. I've been loving the uh, the vodka with a splash of black cherry. I'm not usually a big vodka guy, but this one, it just tastes right. Also, if you like more tequila, they also have a tequila with a splash of lime. Super good, super refreshing, and at 7%, it's that perfect sweet spot where you're not going to get too buzzed, but you don't have to drink a bunch of them to feel anything. And you can check them out at rickyspirits.com. And if Ricky isn't available in your area, hit request Ricky. It's three simple ingredients, low calorie, no added sugar, not overly carbonated. It's an award-winning vodka tequila. You can taste the high quality in spirits with a splash of fruit and sparkling water. Go get Ricky today. It's like high noon, but better, less sweet, and more alcohol per can. All right, so you've got you and you and Mika here yeah. on a little moped. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, is that in Japan? Look at the registration. I think that's you. in Japanese. Yeah, I think that's in, in the paddock in Japan. Okay. Is that a Japanese registration? Yeah, I think it might be. Um, not that the the letters, sorry, the, the numbers obviously are not in Japanese. Right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, we, we had a lot of fun at McLaren. Uh, Ron Dennis. Loved getting the drivers together for dinners and uh, and functions and parties. So Mika and I socially always got along well. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got another picture actually where we, we we went to a black tie function and he's wearing the dinner jacket and I'm wearing the kilt. And me, I suppose, or, or, or him together, we decided it'd be funny if we pop out of the room, come back in, I'm wearing the dinner jacket uh, the, and he's wearing the kilt just to see what people's reactions are. You know, just silly shit like that when you're in your 20s, you, you yeah. think, oh, this is going to be really fun. And how do you keep that balance? Yeah. How, I mean, because I never understand that. Yeah, there's a lot of talk of like, you know, the teammates, but then especially when it feels like it, it, it all, it, you can be buddy-buddy until you're competing for a championship. Like, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're good. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, 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 no. You're, you know, my enemy now. And, you know, he won these two championships and he's considered a legendary driver. But, you know, going through the stats, you beat him a couple of years. What? How come some years he's got the leg on you, other years you got the leg on him? It's confusing to somebody who just wants things to make sense. I know. I know. I understand. Um, yeah, look, that's the facts uh, of the seven years we were together uh, as teammates. Then, yeah, I did finish in front of him in the championship a few times. But sadly for me, lucky for him or well done for, for Mika, the, the, the years that really counted were the, the competitive ones. And uh, he, he won those championships. He was just a little bit better. There you go. Um, you know, I've never tried to hide that. Mika was a brilliantly fast driver over a single lap. Single lap performance gave you a big advantage, obviously, over pit stop strategy. And we, we raced in an era when it was very unreliable. You expected not to finish like four or five Grand Prix a year. So if you ended up having worse reliability, that could help you. You know, I think it was, was 2000, 2001, when I finished second in the, the Chivers Championship. Up until almost mid-season, you know, I was pretty tight with Michael and then you know I made mistakes so the, the reliability was bad and then we never saw Michael again you know he won the championship <laughs> easily right 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 all right we've got what uh, we got here Australia 1998 there were some team orders in this race is this you yeah. congratulating him or is this you screaming in his face we're trying to we, we weren't sure well, I don't recall exactly the words. I've never seen this image before, but I'm pretty sure because we had an agreement before the race. And then um, for various reasons, Mika ends up behind me on track. And then I was asked to let him pass. I did. So I'm probably leaning in saying, I kept my side of the bargain. You know, I, I've honored our agreement um, or something to those that effect. Mm. So when you saw Hungary, were you were you getting acid flashbacks? Was that was that really yeah. traumatizing? How traumatizing was Hungary for you? Yeah, I actually think it was one of my better broadcasts. Um, I mm. work with Channel Four, and I think it's on the F One app as well. Actually, yes. with Alex Jakes, and I, I could I just while everyone's going, Whoa, what does this mean? I, I was very clear how I felt it was wrong to sort of put it on the drivers like that, and I just don't think that. The, I don't think McLaren will use the same term, terminology again because they were still finding their way as to how to deal with this. Right. And it was being challenged by the drivers. And that's just uncomfortable for all of us to listen to and to observe. But right. hey, just because McLaren have won world championships in the past, 
it, they don't have all that sort of DNA locked away in, yeah. in their cerebellum. You know, it's different people. So it's a winning team, but it's a whole group of different people who are living this opportunity, f not maybe for the first time, you know, um, the, the team principal's been successful at Ferrari in his former life. Uh, but for Zach Brown, you know, CEO, he's never run or been a CEO of a Formula One team before, let alone one Grand Prix, let alone had to sort of observe suddenly I'm the CEO of what is arguably the quickest car in Formula One right now. How brilliant right. must I feel? High class. It seems like a high class headache, though. Jesus. Yes, this is absolutely. This is uh, this is more kind of bromance here. You uh, apologizing to Meek after uh, colliding in Australia is this you giving him flowers? <laughs> yeah, I doubt that. It looks like we're at some event together. We did so many, so many events for West, who were the the main sponsor at that time. Just to give you an idea of a typical, let's say, two week cycle. So you'd finish the Grand Prix on a Sunday night. We'd fly back separately in two private planes, land at Nice Airport, take two separate cars back to Monaco, <laughs> drive Monday night back to the airport, get in two separate planes, fly to Barcelona or Jerez, test together for three days, maybe, maybe get on the same plane if West had organised it to fly to somewhere Eastern Europe to encourage those who smoke to buy West rather than Marlboro or whoever else. <laughs> then we get home on Saturday or Sunday and we do our sort of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday preparation for the next Grand Prix where we'd get in two different planes, fly to the racetrack. It was crazy what we were doing. Yeah. So you'd get together for events and you'd be friendly and polite and we'd have the odd party. But during anything to do with testing and racing, you just said good morning and good night. That was it. I see. So this is well, all an act. So this well now you're you know, now you're out of F one you know you're you're yeah. retired you don't have to worry about these things and this is uh you you know you doing the uh, Titanic pose yes. with your friend Mark Weber who I know has been on your podcast uh what's uh what's what's going on here what's 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 that relationship like yeah look, I have a great relationship with Mark uh, we were a couple of years together as teammates you know I was in the way out he was in the way up uh you know one of the quickest guys um you know, over a single lap and won a bunch of Grand Prix and could have been the world champion uh, up until I think the first year Seb won the championship. He never led the world championship until that race was concluded and then he was crowned the champion. Mark was ahead of him. So, oh. um, you know, Mark's a buddy. He lives very close by here in, in uh, Fonvier in Monaco, uh, as does his client, Oscar Piastri. Uh, as I mentioned, Lando, we're all within, you know, Max, Hulkenberg. There's seven or eight drivers or ex-drivers within this little area of Monaco. Um, so yeah, Mark and I get along well, which is why I'm comfortable without fear of anything to right. have him straddle me on a electric scooter. Absolutely. <laughs> what did you, what did you make of, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, the Oscar Lando situation, whether Oscar is not a number two driver, obviously Mark had had that situation in his career and seems to be, you know, looking out for his, you know, his clients saying what happened to me is not going to happen to you, my friend. What yeah. uh, what was your, your takeaway of that whole situation um, there? Well, look, first of all, McLaren and Mark uh, or Mark and McLaren and Anne, uh, Mark's wife, right. did an amazing job to when it looked like Daniel wasn't working out. Could you actually think of the scenario? Alpine think they've got a contract on Oscar. Daniel has got a contract. McLaren pay Daniel not to race for them. And then uh, McLaren go into bat to help pull Oscar away from Alpine, who it turns out didn't have a binding contract. And then he's, the, you know, so the, the turmoil to get him in that seat was, you know, incredible. And now he's in that seat. He's up against a little bit more experienced Lando, who has understandably, I guess, knows the team well, let's say being a bit more settled. So I think the feeling is they're both number ones, but right now Lando's earned the right to be ahead in the championship and, and Oscar's played his part in that. But going forward, you know, reset into 25, I'm sure Mark is going to be saying, hey, gloves are off. Whoever gets into that championship lead should be getting the support. And you lived that exact situation with McLaren and uh, Williams. McLaren tried to take you from Williams, and uh, that went yeah. to some weird court. Yeah, it's and called... you actually lost and had to go back. 
<laughs> well, no, no, not entirely. But um, thank you for almost reading all my book. Uh, but the, the, the page you skipped uh, had the next part that explains. So I, I had a contract with... Uh, so I did eight races in 1994 and I shared the car with Nigel Mansell as right, Williams yeah. were trying to figure out who was going to replace the irreplaceable. You know, Ayrton, no one could replace him. The... I turned up at the end of 94, December 94, to sign what was agreed with, um, with my management and myself and Williams, a two-year contract. As I go into the room, Frank Williams, who was in standing up in his wheelchair, uh, he had a stand-up wheelchair where he used to you know, do his phone calls and everything. He went, I've changed my mind. I only want to do a one-year contract because Damon was playing hardball in his contract and he was pissed off with the drivers. I hadn't done anything. So we went from direct from Williams, having signed a one-year contract. We drove to McLaren because Ron Dennis had been courting us through 95, uh, through 94, excuse me. And we signed a contract 96, 97 to race for McLaren. I then jumped in my car and drove home to Scotland for Christmas and said to my parents, good news, I'm going to be a Grand Prix driver for the next three years. Next year with Williams and then the following two years with McLaren. Oh. And my dad kind of went, what the, f what, what the, what? And my mum went, oh, that's nice, son. What would you <laughs> like, what would you like for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was only during the 95 year that, Mac that Williams decided they did want to have me oh. for 96, 97. Uh -huh. And they wanted to enforce my test contract, which uh -huh. they had a test contract with me, but not a race contract. So it went to the contract recognition board they found in favour of McLaren. I then oh. finished the 95 season with Williams and then joined McLaren for 96, 97. I read this whole book in a day. And when it started getting into contractual stuff, I like, it was like, eh, this is kind of boring. Yeah. The, what the, I the, should have done. Like when people talk about downforce, it's, you know, it's tough. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's tough, <laughs> tough to get into too many of the technicalities here. Okay, I'm going to um... update the book for you. And I'm going to put in a reference to condoms around the contracts to keep <laughs> yes. you engaged. Yeah, yes, exactly. That's right. Okay. Let's, okay. This, this moment here, an iconic moment in f1 history that we wish would happen more that the guys fight off track or that they try to just big you big up you in the paddock when where, where is he you know, headed this, where is he headed where is he he's headed? coming to say hello to me <laughs> yeah. this is this is michael schumacher after your crash in belgium um in 1998 um, do you think he looks angry <laughs> Or just he looks, he looks determined <laughs> to do something. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're, when when you see him, when you see him, Terminator. I mean, you guys yeah. are two, you guys are two Terminators looking looking gentlemen to the both of you. Are you like okay? Let's you know. Are you fight or flight mode? Did you have your hands up? Like what what's going through your mind as Michael Schumacher's charging at you? Well, I remember um, there was a wall of McLaren mechanics between me and him. Um, and one of those mechanics, uh, his name was Steve Morrow. Sadly, he's no longer with us, but his nickname was Forklift. And anyone who knows what a forklift is, <laughs> yeah. he was a big guy. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I'm thinking, hey, Michael, I, I had my helmet on and I remember shouting back at him. He's shouting at me, were you trying to fucking kill me? And I'm shouting back at him, you ran in the back of me. You know, so it, the, it was the aggressive exchange rather than I'm going to run away. Yeah. I'm not a fighter. Look, and I don't think Michael would have fought. I think he would have got a hold of me maybe by the scruff of the neck and we would have, you know, exchanged our opinions. But look, he was an amazing champion, an amazing driver. Uh, this was an unfortunate blip in our relationship. We kissed and made up and it, what it has done, it, it guaranteed me a place in the Schumacher documentary. <laughs> and I, it always gets brought up every year we go to spa yeah. Um, but what was incredible, Michael with no front wing and three wheels was still incredibly quick in the wet. <laughs> That's how talented he was. <laughs> and actually I, I, you can see, but behind this, this wall, I've got a, a collection of different helmets from drivers that I've raced against. And one of them's from Michael and he wrote on it. So many great battles on track, some of them harder than others. So many great parties off track. Enjoy retirement because I've retired before, before he did, and uh, and and you know. So I, I cherish those those thoughts and those memories because you know you you go into battle, but it's a bit like the boxers, isn't it? They beat the hell out of each other and then then they hug and say nice things about their family. Right. So 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 is that? I mean, just for people who are in who who get into fights, 
I mean, I think this is a lesson. I mean, how, don't you kiss and make. How do you kiss and make up after something like that? I think, well, I think people want to know how, to, how do you conflict resol- resolution something like this. Yeah. Well, that was the Sunday of the Belgian Grand Prix. On the yeah. Tuesday, we are in Monza testing ahead of the Italian Grand Prix, which would have been two weeks later or one week later. I don't recall exactly, but certainly, you know, the coming week or, or the week later. And there was banners in the grandstand that Italian fans had made up, the Tifosi, that said killer coal fard. And every time I pulled out of the garage, they were booing. And if I walked to talk to my engineer, they were, you know, it was pretty enthusiastic dislike. That's pretty cool. I would adopt that. Killer coal fard? That's pretty good. That's pretty dope, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what was clear from that, it was an uncomfortable two or three days of testing. And Bernie Eccleston found out, and we, when we turned up at the, the Italian Grand Prix, he organised for us to sit down in his motorhome and clear the air, just Michael and I. And that's where the conversation was born out of me going, Michael, look, I accept my part in that accident. You've got to accept yours. He wouldn't accept it. And I asked him, did surely you must be wrong sometime? <laughs> and he went, no, and I went, come on, when you're at home with your wife, you must be wrong. He went, nope. <laughs> and <laughs> have you ever been wrong? And he paused and went, not that I remember. <laughs> and at that point, I just gave up and went, <laughs> right. That's why he's a world champion and I'm not, <laughs> yeah. because I know when I'm wrong. <laughs> that's, oh, that's wild. That's so great. he accepted your apology, but then we shook just hands like... and moved on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. You got, you got a picture here with, with Lewis Hamilton in the Royal Air Force wearing the full garb. Can you tell us a little bit about what what this was, what this day entailed? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this was a feature we did for BBC and when I was working for them, uh, Red Arrows, which is our uh, display team for the Royal Air Force. We went over to, I think it's RAF Scampton. And I remember we, uh, I picked up Lewis in, in a helicopter in Battersea, which is the only place you can land a helicopter in London. If you follow Tom Cruise, you'll see him very often in London getting out of his helicopter. It's usually at Battersea. And anyway, we, we took off from, from Battersea. I sat in the front with the pilot. Lewis was in the back and he fell asleep. He must have been either out partying or whatever the night before. And um, we, we hit fog on the way to the, the airfield. And we, we basically had to put down in a field, in a cornfield. And because they knew there was big uh, wind generators between Battersea and getting to the, the airfield. And we sat there probably for a good 45 minutes. Oh, the whole time Lewis is asleep, we eventually take off. We eventually turn up at the airfield late. As you can see, there wasn't any fog. And then... He, we, we got to go up with the RAF together and then he drove his Formula One car in a sort of sh- shootout along the, the runway. And I have a picture in my office wall here, actually, where I'm in, the, in the, the jet fighter and he is in the Formula One car. And um, yeah, it, it was just a fun experience. It was a great feature. And then a few years later, I did a feature with uh, Tom Cruise where he drove the Formula One car. And then we did it again with Mark Webber and Steve Jones, where Tom uh, and uh, ourselves drove uh, around Silverstone in Porsche road cars ahead of the Top Gun Maverick launch. And we got to do some of those iconic li- lines. Were you, you, know? were you impressed? I saw, I think I saw a video of that he spun, but he looked like he was doing pretty well in the car, yeah. right? Man, he, he was on it. And you only had to tell him once how all the procedures were. And I guess that's because he's a pilot. You know, a helicopter looks a lot more complicated to operate than a Formula One car. So, yeah, I don't, you know, I can't really recall where he was lap time wise, but he was, to my mind, and with the greatest yeah. respect of uh, uh, to Brad Pitt, who I don't know, haven't met and haven't seen him drive, I would have thought Tom would have been a very natural fit for the F1 movie in terms of driving and leading man. Mm. Um, but it, that's fallen to Brad and we're all, Curious to see how the movie looks when and it I, comes and, out. And I wanted to, you know, speaking of jet fighters, and I, I, you wrote kind of skeptically in your book. It was so funny to read. You were like, actually, like, going into space, you don't pull that. You did all the space tests. I think we have a yeah. picture of that. Oh, yeah. You're like, yeah. they don't even... They don't even pull that many G's. Like you were like kind of unimpressed with the Russian space force or whatever the hell they're called, the cosmonauts. Yeah. The cosmonauts. You were you 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 know, I watched the I remember as a kid I grew up watching the right stuff, like the the, yeah. the test these pilots, and you were like you went through all those tests and you were like, meh, 
<laughs> not that big a deal. Well, look, you just say as you find. And of course, jet fighter pilots, that when they pull sustained high G, that's incredible. But when it comes to going on a rocket into space, they don't really pull a lot of G. And, and quite frankly, all the only skill you need at that point is to fit yourself in a very small capsule for, a, you know, obviously they sit there for a while before the launch, but the actual launch into space is only a few minutes. So, you, you know, it's not, we're not doing a great deal. So I, I just didn't, I, I had the chance to be a space tourist. Wes were going to pay for Mika and I to go up there and it was 20 million they were prepared to pay the Russian agency. And both Mika and I individually, having gone and done the training in yeah. Star City outside Moscow, we both went, nah, <laughs> nah. <laughs> we're good. Okay, yeah. well, they, they they were doing, they did some fun stuff over at McLaren because there was this this iconic Spice Girls moment for the car launch that was, <laughs> I yeah. mean, this was, you know, uh, I feel like in, in, in recent years as with the this is broken survive through. of it all, yeah. uh, you know, everyone's now obsessed with this kind of, this moment of cultural kind of like relevancy that was happening then that it feels like people are more, it's, it's it feels like this could be possible now and it's so cool to see that this happened and it's yeah. so bizarre. Well, uh, every generation thinks that they're inventing fun for the first time, but the reality <laughs> is, you know, imagine being in a rock band in the 70s, that must have been pretty wild and, yeah. you know, the rock bands of today probably think they're wild, but you know, I dare say they could learn a few things. So this was uh, the 97 launch of the West McLaren Mercedes livery. The Spice Girls hadn't broken through. They just released that single, mm. Wannabe. The headline for the performance that night was Jamiroquai, who's a British singer um, who you may, may or may not have heard of, but it's worth checking out his, his music. And the Spice Girls were kind of there as... The as well, look, yeah, yeah, you know, they, they were, you know, MTV was popular at that time. So Davina McCall, who what was an MTV jock, this V jockey, or whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, it's Jerry Horner or Jerry Halliwell yeah. who's standing beside Mika in the red uh, cape. But anyway, yeah, so West did a lot of fun things back then. And, you know, the cigarette sponsorship obviously doesn't exist anymore in, in sport, but that meant there was plenty of budget for big, you know, they took over Alexander Palace. It's a huge palace. They filled it with tens of thousands of people. It was a celebration of the unveiling of a car. You know what Formula One are doing next year? a stadium unveiling of all the cars, you know, right. it's only taken them since 97 until, you know, 2025 to basically go back to doing what we were doing back then. Pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of fun, we've got these uh, multiple pictures here of you in uh, some drag. Yeah. With um, your fellow Scotsman, Susie Wolf. And this was um, uh, Wings for Life is a spinal cord research foundation and we would do every year in london a fundraiser and it became the silly thing where people would pay and i forget they would pay like 10 grand for me to wear something bizarre and as you can see bizarre to them is me in dresses uh, a ballerina outfit <laughs> uh, a little leopard skin print <laughs> yeah i think i did I get the matching heels oh you don't see the heels but uh, you can see right, my yeah, fun not... size mars bar poking okay. out the front of that uh, <laughs> stretchy dress. <laughs> um, amazing. More more costume work here. You as Superman here. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. The, 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 that was, yeah, that was uh, a couple of years ago at the uh, Red Bull factory for the Channel 4 show. And it just about fitted me because <laughs> I'm 10 kilos heavier than when I stopped racing. So it's fair to say things don't quite fit the way they used to. Yeah, you wait. I wanted to ask you about that. You, uh, be, I wanted to get into this. I mean, you you talked for years about struggling with your weight, and you said when you were younger, you you mentioned it in your book briefly that you struggled with bulimia. I mean, my girlfriend works at an eating disorder clinic, and and she, and the, that stuff is like really harrowing and and tough yeah. to get over. How did you, especially when your livelihood depends on it? How did you regain a sort of semblance of balance with food and your body? Yeah, and that sort well, of thing. Yeah, um, th that was in, I'd say that was kind of 87, 88. So I would have been 15, 16. And I was already tall um, <clears throat> for my age. And back then, the, the karting formula went from age 11 
to 16 basically and there's the weight just the the weight minute uh, minute excuse me limit that had been put in place just didn't cover the bigger guys so I basically had to be skin and bone to still be competitive. I wanted to be competitive. This mattered so much to me. So I was bulimic for the reasons of I was weighing myself twice a day, morning and night. And if I knew I couldn't make weight, I, that meant I wouldn't win the race. So not making weight was not an option. So you hear of jockeys go through it. I'm sure there's other sports. But as soon as I went to cars and the driver weight was included in the car, literally overnight, stopped have all of that because suddenly I could train normally, I could eat normally, and then I gained my normal body weight. But yeah, it, it was not a cool place to be. Uh, but of course, now they've changed all that. So you race from eight years old until I think 10 or 11, and then you race from like 10 or 11 to like 14, and then you go, you know, the bigger kids into being an adult. So um, it was just a uh, consequence of the regulations of the 80s. Oh, I see. I see. So don't worry. If you take me out to dinner, I'll be ordering the T-bone. <laughs> okay. It's, it, it's, it's, invitation uh, it's invitation uh, accepted. That's um, right. Next, next year in Monaco. Um, yeah. what, 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 I mean, we're, 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 we're wasting enough of, uh, of your yes, time. I, but well, I, I, yeah, yeah. I wanted to know, I mean... What what are your I mean what what are your predictions for the rest of the year? This is coming out during break. I mean, do you think do you think this thing is on? Who do you, who do you see uh, in in terms of constructors uh, outlook for twenty twenty five? Who's getting the Sauber seat? I mean, you could take ta any burning opinions or takes whatever whatever you want. Take take whatever you want. So I don't have crystal balls. So all of this, of course, is just this is what it feels like might happen rather than me having inside track. Yeah. Uh, it, it feels that Max will secure his fourth world title. Yes. It, it could go wrong. He could get taken out in uh, you know, next two races and Lando wins, wins them all. But it just feels kind of like yeah. that, that, uh, that he what he did in Brazil was a, anyone that was building momentum towards he's just not nice and therefore he doesn't deserve to win the title. They've had to go, yeah, this isn't a nice uh, nice Sport. personality championship. This is yeah, who, yeah, drives, yeah. who drives you'd the most be, You'd be the Michael Schumacher of the personality championship. Yeah, well, I thank you. I thank yeah. you. My ex-wife might not say that, but anyway. Um, so it constructors, McLaren, there's no reason why they should lose that. It just feels they've got the two drivers, they've got the momentum of the car. And look, a lot of rumor about who should and could be in the, the, the Audi or the Sauber. It yeah. kind of feels, much as I like Valtteri, and I think he's a very safe pair of hands, it just feels like what we've seen from Colo Pinto could be enough to kind of swing it. I, I, I saw uh, Max talk highly of uh, Bortoletto and the Formula 2 driver. So it just kind of feels that maybe the momentum, the time they've taken will be in favour of a young guy. They don't have to announce until much later, you know, and after the season, who yeah. the driver's going to be. They've got Hulkenberg you know, who's been given a, a wonderful opportunity to go with that team for the final couple of years of his career, I guess. Um, well earned because he was turning some pretty good qualifying positions in the Haas, which has turned out not to be a bad car, actually, when you've yeah. seen some results of late. So I think what we've seen over the last few races is very difficult to rest your laurels on anything, isn't it? Because things change so quickly. You know, you've, you've suddenly got Ferrari winning unbelievably in Mexico and then looking kind of average in Brazil. What yeah. the hell changed? Uh, Red Bull seats. What, what's, what's going on? Who's getting the Red Bull seats? Oh, Is yeah. it Checo forever? Um, Nothing lasts forever. And okay. therefore, there, there has to be an end. Um, Checo must be disappointed. And if he isn't, then he's not the person I think he is. And if he is the person I think he is. So he's disappointed. He knows he's underperforming. Max is exceptional. But it just feels like unless something changes in the next three races, that nature will take its course. I don't yeah. know how what that involves in terms of how strong his contract is. Is it about payment? But you you need somebody being within a couple of tenths of max is sufficient to get one two in the the constructors uh, in the drivers and in the constructors if the car's working.
And obviously, Man. it should be Yuki yeah. Sonoda, as we oh. all know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, well, you at one point said that he should pack his bag. Yes, you and, did. And, you, know, you said he should pack his but, bags. Well, what do you got to say now? <laughs> well, look, everyone deserves the opportunity to defend themselves. And there was a point in Yuki's early career where I don't think he was doing enough to, to warrant the title of being a Grand Prix driver. I think he has done an exceptional job this year. He's sent one of the Grand Prix winning drivers and one of the fans' favourites home packing yeah. uh, in Daniel. And he's got Liam there, who I think's done a very solid job coming in. So in terms of who's been there long enough to, to deserve the chance, you would say Yuki. But the team may well go, well, do we think Yuki's going to beat Max? And therefore, if we don't think he's going to beat Max, what's that going to do to him? And therefore, who's going to be our experienced team leader at our sister team? You know, there's a lot of different things to consider because Max right. has broken pretty much every driver who's ever been his teammate. <laughs> yes. Yes, he has. So do you want Yuki to be broken or do you to want be, Yuki to, right. to be the, you know, the potential talent that he is? Mm, when you put it that way, so who are you putting in that? You're, you're. What do you, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I see the rumors like you do. I see the rumors that call a Pinto. They're negotiating for him. I, I, I hear the the Yuki one. I hear the Liam one. Uh, man, take your pick because uh, any one of them is going to have a tough time uh, coming to terms with Max. Yeah, whose whose but... life do you want to ruin? Well, those <laughs> <two guys. laughs> That's kind of the question at hand exactly. here. <laughs> it does feel, given that Yuki and Liam have seats in formula one it does feel not having color pinto on the grid next year yeah doesn't seem right given what he's right. shown he's shown himself you know yeah he made a mistake in brazil yeah more experienced drivers have, have crashed in that corner so uh, we won't hold that against him but man actually talking about crashes a number of the teams are up against it because the, the crashes come out of the budget cap yeah and if you're williams if you're aston you know they, these crashes add up and also yeah. spare parts. You know, you, you're probably working on the chassis for next year's car if you're changing chassis. You know, some of the long lead items are probably st already being made because they've got to have the car ready for February. So, and crash testing and all the rest of it. So some of these teams might be struggling going back to old parts for the right. final few races. Mm. You can't just go, make us a floor. wrenches in the works. Yeah, yeah. indeed. And and oh, okay, and tw and twenty twenty five, you know, of these the, these top four teams, do you do you see you know McLaren to continue the? Do you see Red Bull maybe figuring their yeah, stuff? Yeah, you out? got a crystal like, ball. You... Come on, we know you. You predicted the Red Bull dominance. Who do you got twenty twenty five? I think with very little regulation change, just some small tweaking, then it will continue to be the evolution. Now, Red Bull won the bunch, you know, the first few races. But they've obviously gone down a track of development that wasn't giving them. You know, you, you run something, it doesn't quite give you what you expect, but it's not worse. And it's part of a program of items, long lead items that are going to be there in two weeks, four weeks, whatever. So once they have figured that out, they have got the chance to springboard again in the same way that just because McLaren are there doesn't mean that they, they haven't peaked and the next few iterations yeah. are not giving the performance. So it's so difficult to predict yeah. I just want more of what we've seen this year, which is more than one team winning. You know, we've had some pretty lean years in Formula One. It's just been dominated by Mercedes or dominated by Red Bull or Ferrari. Let's go for, if we can have four different teams win next year, we're, we're, we're going to have a great year, I think. Yeah. All right, la last, last dumb question, and then and I'll let you go. In your book, Formula for Success, you talked extensively about the key to success being commitment, hard work, working so much harder than the next guy. Like you can't like the way to being successful. It's like, it's just a lot of examples of being, you know, all the hard work it takes to be being successful. And then in your other book, it is what it is. You were like, yeah, but Kimi Raikkonen didn't really try that hard. <laughs> <laughs> and he was really good as a teammate. And you were like, damn, he just kind of shows up and is quick. Huh? What did Kimi Raikkonen do to your sort of psyche? Yeah, he's the outlier and all that. Um, <laughs> he he was just a great, great natural talent. He had, you know, he went from Formula Renault to driving a Sauber at Mugello. Mugello is one of the proper scary racetracks that you can go around in a Grand Prix car. Um, he he just had so much talent. But can you imagine? He won one World Championship, 
And you could go, yeah, McLaren, reliability, all that sort of stuff. But if he had the work ethic of Michael, I think he would have won more. Because Michael, Michael was at the test track, he was at the factory, and we, if you're there standing over engineers and mechanics and things, like that, it, they, they feel it, it empowers them, that you are the fuel that helps drive them forward. So I say this, I stand by work ethic, is the difference be, between being a humble one-time world champion or what he could have been, which could have been a multiple world champion. Wow. Work hard, kids. Don't be, don't right. be like, don't be like, you leave you with this. Don't be like Kimi Raikkonen, you guys. Work hard. Make the most of your talents. <laughs> Work hard and take protection. Always <laughs> be prepared. Exactly. Um, David, where can people find, you know, you have your, you have your podcast. We'll, we'll plug, we'll plug a competitor. What's, where can people, where can people find you? Well, uh, and all the normal places you would pick up a podcast, um, and it is under the title formula for success. And it actually is more to do with the fact that Eddie Jordan says for fuck's sake all the time. So right. that's what FOS really means. Yeah. But, um, we couldn't put that as a, as a title. For fuck's sake. For fuck's sake. Right. So <laughs> formula for success is why it's called FFS, which is quite difficult for me to get my lips around as a Scotsman. Sure. <laughs> um, and then we know you also have um, your uh, organization, More Than Equal. Yeah. Can you so tell all, maybe any people young a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Any talented young girls out there in karting, you've gone down the local kart track, you love it, you, you think you've got talent. And or, and or you're showing that you've got speed, then get in contact with More Than Equal because we've put together a program which is supporting the, um, the identified girls this year who will be given all of the guidance physically, mentally, everything that a Max, a Lewis, a Charles, whoever your favourite driver would have been given. And we will help guide them and support them to realize their full potential. Because I believe that a lot of really talented young girls in karting, where the girls and boys actually compete very equally, girls are winning, mm -hmm. boys are winning. It's puberty into adult life where things change. Now, some brilliant talents, uh, boys, when they go through puberty, whether it's soccer players or formula or, or carters, they get distracted. They, they don't have the passion. You know, when you change from boy to man, you, you don't always have the same desires and all the rest of it. So yeah. you've got to be able to, you, you find the talent once you've gone through, but you've got to guide them through and show them that there is a route towards being a professional. And that's where W Series came in. That's where uh, Formula Academy comes in. And the goal is to support and find uh, the first female world champion, which, you know, isn't going to happen next year. Um, it may take a decade. It may take longer. Who knows? But if we try there's a very high likelihood with hard work and commitment, we'll succeed. And her name is? Is she seven? How old is she? <laughs> yeah, she probably is seven or eight, yeah. nine yeah. years old right now. Yeah, yeah. it's a very good question. And if, and, yeah. and if you know anyone. You're looking, you're looking. Yeah. David, right. David, we have, we David Coulter is out yeah. there looking. So if you're the yeah. next future world champion and you're, and you're a young girl, reach out to uh, More Than Equal. Yes. Um, thank you so much for coming on the pod. We start this podcast with Vas up Venkas, which is a ode to Gunter Steiner. Can you honor us with a goodbye Venkas? Goodbye Venkas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Through the goodbye, accent Vankas. in there. <laughs>